This is the Language of Business, a show to inform and inspire entrepreneurs and anyone thinking about a startup. Hear about strategies that work and strategies that often don't work from people who've been there and done that. Our host is Gregory Stoller, Harvard MBA and senior lecturer at Boston University Questrom School of Business. Here's Greg Stoller. If you're the type of manager who does well by walking around and talking to your employees, how do you do that when everybody is social distancing? We're on location with Jason Ray, the CEO and founder of Paperless Parts, and welcome to the Language of Business. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Jason, what exactly does Paperless Parts do to make it easier for customers digitally? Yeah, so we work with manufacturers, and I I think it's important to explain that every job, every manufacturing job starts with sending a quote. And that's where paperless parts focuses on. So we help manufacturers leverage the digital data in the request for quote package. So basically, you know, I've designed this coffee cup in CAD, and now I want some manufacturer to make it. Well, what we've done is we've made it really easy to understand the geometry that we're seeing in that CAD model and understand how that geometry relates to the manufacturer's specific capabilities. And by understanding that, we make it really easy to quote. Jason, how do you do management by walking around when there's nobody to walk around and see? It's really challenging. Um, I I find myself to be the type of leader who really likes to engage with people face-to-face, really like to understand how people are doing, what's going on in their day-to-day lives. I think um, there's a saying that if it's not right at home, it's not going to be right anywhere. And now that everyone is working from home, it is, uh, it's even more challenging to understand how things are going in, you know, my team's personal lives to make sure that they're, you know, they're feeling their best when they're showing up to work. Um, some of the ways we do that are by having coffee hours, by, you know, having beers on Friday afternoon, by just, general check-ins. I mean, I think digital tools have come to the rescue here in a lot of regards. I mean, this this conversation that we're having over Zoom is, you know, it's a little bit different than being face-to-face in person, um, but it, it definitely helps. Given your uh, experience in the military, how has military style efficiency helped paperless parts these days? There are, no, there are no orders. There's no having to tell somebody to do their job. There's no trying to get people to show up on time or give 100% effort. Um, I think when, when the entire company is rallied around a common goal, it's, um, it, it's a really powerful force that kind of puts, puts the guardrails up and, and keeps everybody moving in the same direction. So I, I think that's, it's actually been, I wouldn't say it's been easy, but it's definitely much easier with that in mind. And especially as a startup, I mean, we're all fighting for survival. And what has been that common goal that Paperless Parts is rallying around? We are trying to move manufacturing to be more digital. Um, We find that in general, a lot of industries have embraced digital tools, SaaS, software, to drive efficiency in their businesses. And we don't see that happening in manufacturing very often. And it seems like a fantastic opportunity to support people who are entrepreneurs just like us, who are building businesses and are very just underserved by modern software technology and and modern tools. So um, the common mission here is to help American manufacturers win, um, help them be more successful in their day-to-day lives. And how is Paperless Parts specifically helping those U.S. manufacturers win? Yeah, thank you. The entire tool is built on the cloud. So we're on Amazon GovCloud. We're ITAR and NIST compliant, a couple of terms that are very important to manufacturers today. And what we've done is we've taken a lot of the best practices that we've seen out of other software tools, be it Slack or Google Drive or Dropbox, and we've built those into a platform that is very manufacturing-centric. Um, It really takes into consideration the novel aspects of running a manufacturing business, whereas a lot of these tools are built to be generic just for anyone. Um, So we are highly customized to the needs of um, custom part manufacturers. So to an extent, it sounds like that should be completely unaffected by COVID-19 in terms of the technology. Outside of your employees, is that the case? In terms of being impacted, our company is very fortunate that we can all work from home. And I I think there's a really interesting thing happening where investors are talking about, well, commercial real estate's going to go through the floor. 
And it's going to be a paradigm shift in the way people work. And I think it's a little bit early to make those projections. I find that we have phenomenal velocity right now in our software development, but you can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. So what do my developers do? They work around the clock. You know, it's either this or Fortnite. And, you know, it's a, it's, if they can, that's, this is what they're going to work on. And so I don't know that people will experience that same level of efficiency going forward as the world starts to open. And I do think that there is significant value to having a centralized location where you can rally the troops and get everybody on the same page. Are you concerned that your customers are going to have to wait longer before they sign purchase orders, et cetera, because of COVID? Absolutely. I think, and we're, we're working really hard to support our customers. I think there's a central, kind of a central do no harm mission. Like we never want to have a negative impact on our customers. I don't want to hurt their cash flow. The last thing I want is a manufacturer not being able to make payroll because they're paying for paperless parts. So we monitor our customers very closely in terms of their success in business and their success with our platform. It is a quoting platform. So we, we do have the ability to see, are they getting opportunities? to quote? Are they being successful in winning those opportunities? Um, but I've seen, I've seen several manufacturers who've said, you know, Jason, right now, we, we just, we can't, can't handle the cash impact. And, and for some of those shops, we've been able to work on terms with them and, and make it work so that we can be a part of their resurgence and their success going forward. What is the single biggest thing that keeps you up at night about the future of paperless parts? I wake up at two o'clock in the morning thinking about the layoffs that have happened in Boston, and I'm trying to figure out how I can build a company where we never have to do that. And that might be naive to say where, you know, if you've got 2,500 people and you end up having to lay off a significant portion of your workforce because of unforeseen things, but I would really like to build this company in a way where I can make sure that I'm taking care of the people who've committed to being here. Jason, thank you very much. Thanks, Greg. Jason Ray. Founder and CEO of Paperless Parts. Big choices after college, right? Grad school, maybe? Soar from your undergraduate major to a great career in business. Biomedical engineer to healthcare analyst. Health science to clinical systems analyst. Mechanical engineer to solutions engineer. Before you know it, you can have a master's degree in management studies. Nine months and you're in business. How would you like to easily be able to disinfect your entire life? And no, we're not talking about COVID-19. For people who have their entire lives in their handbag, this might be the product for you. We're on location with Sue Fuller, who is the co-founder of The Oliver Thomas, and welcome to the Language of Business. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me today. How do you disinfect a handbag, Sue? Very easy, actually. You just take your bag, you turn it inside out, put it in the washing machine on cold, and then put it in the dryer. And the fabrics or the designs won't either be damaged or destroyed? With Oliver Thomas, all of our bags are designed with quilted polyester, and they're actually meant to withstand a few things. One is high um, abrasion resistance. Secondly, they, are, they have fade-proof technology. And then third, they're actually made to withstand high heat. So that does allow for the disinfecting to take place. Is this something you came up with in response to COVID-19 or was it something that you were working on previously for a while? This actually started from um, the initial concept of the brand. We know that everyone is uh, very busy running around, particularly the Oliver Thomas customer. And we know that she and, and he travel a lot. They go to the gym, so they're frequent gym goers. And so we wanted a bag that went from day to night, week to weekend, and also would be highly washable because of all the contaminants that potentially could get on a bag throughout their average week and when they're traveling. And so this is something that we concepted early on. We then worked with microbiologist specialists to confirm that if you do in fact wash your bag, and then turn around and put it in the dryer that you would see a significant reduction in contaminants. So this started well beyond and before COVID. How many people generally wash their handbags? Well, from what we understand, rarely do people wash any of their bags. And that's one of the reasons why we were so passionate about letting people know about how dirty your bags get and the type of bacterial and fungal that get on it from just carrying it around on an average week. 
we actually categorized, um, we took five of our bags, put them through all the different types of scenarios, taking them to work, to a gym, on an airplane. And then we worked with a microbiologist specialist, which are a certified lab, where they categorized every single contaminant that possibly gets on a bag. And they fed that data back to us. And um, we utilized that to really understand, um, you know, how we could better help our consumers lead a healthier life. How are your bags getting manufactured? Is this a U.S. play? Is this an Asian play? Please help us to understand that. So we actually manufacture in Asia, and all of our bags are also vegan.org certified by the 501c3 out of Washington. So we, we basically manufacture in one facility that is, in fact, certified. That was really important to us. How are you able to coordinate manufacturing in Asia right now? we've run into some really unique situations. About a year ago, I actually opened an office in Hong Kong. And right after I opened that office, some of the rioting started. And um, that was, you know, very unique for us. Um, but what's great is we have an amazing team um, that actually resides over in Asia and oversees all of the production, all of the quality, and um, all the flow of goods. And so we're able to keep operating in any type of environment, whether that be the riots or now we're dealing with the pandemic, um, both over in Asia and now here in the U.S. And we've been really fortunate that um, our business has been mildly interrupted. Are your days and nights these days flipped in that you start work at 12 noon in the States and end at around midnight? I guess what I'm asking is, how do you run an office that you can't physically visit anymore? Well, most people are going to bed in the U.S. probably around 9 or 10 o'clock at night. That actually starts one part of my day. So I'm usually on for about two to three hours with the team over in Asia. And then I sleep for a little bit. I get back up around 2 to 3 a.m., check emails, um, possibly take phone calls if they have any questions at all, go back to bed and then start again at 5.30 a.m., um, catch up on any last-minute happenings over in Asia. And then my day in the U.S. starts around 7.30 or 8 a.m. here. And what makes your relationship with Peloton so unique? We're on our 10th or 11th collaboration with them. And they actually found us when we were three months old. We build product specifically thinking about their consumer in mind. So it's not like they took an Oliver Thomas product and just label slapped on it. We actually, um, I studied their consumer um, really how their consumer lives, what they value. And uh, with every product that we do with them, we really try to take that into account. And it's been a phenomenal relationship. We'll ship in items and sometimes they sell out in within 24 to 48 hours. What is the single biggest thing that keeps you up at night these days about the Oliver Thomas? Gosh, that's a great question. I would say, you know, we're constantly thinking about how we can be better. And even in times of chaos, um, we view it as an opportunity. We're never short of ideas, that's for sure. And so I think it's just, you know, making sure that we are continuing to be meaningful to our customer in the market and bringing them something that is actually improving their lives. If someone came to you right now for counsel about starting a business, what would you tell them? You know, to just go ahead and, and, and try it. Um, I think, you know, the biggest thing that I've learned through this is that you just, you actually have to jump in and just start going and make sure that you are able to quickly pivot. You know, obviously the pandemic has not been the first thing that we've realized as a business that um, has been a little bit chaotic. We were three months um, into our business. We were actually sued in federal court. We won on all counts. Um, we've survived two tariff increases. We've survived riots outside of our office in Hong Kong. And, um, and now we've survived a pandemic. And every single time, you know, I always say that chaos and crisis creates opportunities. And um, I think we're constantly pivoting and we're constantly learning. And I think, you know, that would probably be the advice that I would give anyone. Sue, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Sue Fuller, co-founder of The Oliver Thomas. Have you ever wondered what it's like to work for a boss who really believes it's okay to fail? If so, you might enjoy working with Monsi Gangan. She is founder and president of Nested Bean, and Monsi, welcome to the Language of Business. 
Thank you for having me. Nice to have you here. Mansi, what does Nested Bean do? Um, Nested Bean is a sleep and wellness brand focusing on um, young parents. We make swaddling and uh, sleeping bags for babies. They're lightly weighted. We have a patented design. So by helping the baby sleep better, we're helping the whole family sleep better. And what was your inspiration in starting the business? Oh, my second son, who wouldn't sleep. <laughs> he was the inspiration. I would put him down and he would wake up immediately unless he was held in my arms. Um, so that got me thinking, what is it that babies feel or what, they, what do they receive when they are held? And I tried to sort of mimic that. Um, and that was the inspiration. And I saw there was tremendous research in a simulation of touch uh, through lightly weighted objects and through deep pressure. And that was what the, uh, the solution came from. And a lot of people say it's okay to fail, but few actually live by what they say. What is it like being one of your employees? These days, there is, there is so much that you can try. As long as we know what the goals are, there is really no one way to reach the goal. So why only have one path to it? So what we try to do, and I encourage them, I encourage them to always try new things as long as they have a clear idea of why they're doing it and how does it relate to the goal that we are trying to achieve. Um, they have to learn. And as a result of that, they have to collect data. They have to document. And then they have to present why certain things are better, uh, certain ways of achieving the goal are better than others because they would have documented their findings. And then once we know what's the, what's the best way of achieving the goal, we just accelerate towards it. So when they pitch to you, is it a PowerPoint? Is it a business plan? How do they actually document what you're looking for? As we have grown, our way of documenting or pitching has matured. In the beginning, it used to be a spreadsheet. But then as we started growing and the stakes started getting higher, um, every thought that came into someone's mind was not good enough to be an experiment. So then we created a Word document where they would say what the idea was going to be, what data supports the idea, what the ROI is, and how much fund do they need, how many funds, what, what are the funds that they need to execute on that experiment, when would it end? And typically, if it's more than two weeks, it's not well thought out. So we started creating some parameters around it. Your business has pivoted from formerly being almost all retail to now entirely online. How did you go through that change? When we were changing, when we were shifting our supply chain model, uh, it afforded us a gap of about six to seven months before we could go to a new supplier and have those you know, uh, products land in our warehouses. So in those seven months, we didn't have a lot. We were, we were short of products, so we were not going to sell. So whenever businesses don't um, when they're not selling, I encourage them to build. So we started building our website, building our sales, our met methods to digital market. We started learning. And by the end of 2015, we had a brand new website. And in the whole of middle of, until, you know, for about six months in 2016, we started perfecting our digital marketing techniques. So that's how we pivoted. And now we're about five years later uh, and in the middle of COVID-19, how has Nested Bean had to change its strategy in light of our global pandemic? The way we worked back then and today has not changed a whole lot because we carried those nimble processes uh, with us since the last pivot. But what we have done since COVID-19 is instead of creating long-term plans, even three or six month long plans, We've broken them down into smaller wins just in case, you know, the current situation changes in three months and we don't want to, you know, peg our um, goals or, or targets too far in the future because you're not going to know what the, the next three, four months are going to bring. So we started creating smaller wins. Um, but at the same time, we also started creating um, other opportunities uh, breadth-wise, not deep, so that once things do get lifted, when, when the world you know, go back, goes back to a bit more you know, of normalcy again, that we will be able to scale all of those initiatives at the same time, creating sort of a compounding effect. Not your babies who you designed for, but what keeps you up at night about the future of Nested Bean? Excitement about the growth opportunities keep me up more than, more than anything. 
uh, creating the right team structure. Um, the excitement of it keeps me up because I think, you know, without people, without the culture, uh, companies don't exist. They, they cannot grow. They cannot sustain their growth. Um, and it's not easy attracting the right talent, um, the right minded people. So that's what uh, I think about more than anything else, especially in our growth stage right now. Um, but it's all, it's all stems from excitement. Mansi, thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Mansi Gangan, founder and president of Nested Bean. Are you a problem solver? Do you see the big picture and the small details? Want to turn big data into big decisions? Take AI to the boardroom. Translate rocket science into the science of business. Build your career at digital speed with a master of science in business analytics. Be ready for careers like analytics consultant, data science, analytics strategy, data translator, BI analyst, technical business analyst, 10 months, and you're in business analytics. How much can you trust what you read online is actually going to affect your own business? We're on location with Larry Rhinus, who is an independent footwear consultant. And Larry, welcome to the Language of Business. It's great to meet you. Larry, you will go to different parts of Asia, different international locations. You will contract with manufacturers to help their footwear get made and then try and distribute them or sell them to US-based retailers, correct? Yeah, that is correct. And what are you hearing from your wholesalers right now? And then we'll get to your retailers in a second. There's a confluence of, uh, of events happening right now. So we have the whole COVID issue, which is uh, stopping our commerce here in the U.S. We have the manufacturing base concerned about what they're going to produce because all their orders have been canceled. They've been stopped. They've been held. Factories in some cases have uh, started stitching masks instead of uh, uppers for shoes. And uh, some factories are just waiting for the, the light to light switch to be turned on so that they can go. Some of the uh, retailers would suggest that they're gonna go back to the old fashioned, very one-on-one -on -one service type of selling where they're by appointment, uh, help customers in their stores. Others are just going to be doing the social distance. So we don't know really what, it, what it's going to look like. We know it's going to be an opening. We don't know uh, what that's going to, how that's going to look. When there's an opening, let's start with the cost side of the equation. Do you anticipate costs are going to change? I don't know the answer to that yet. What we, what we have is we have uh, warehouses filled with spring merchandise. We have stores filled with spring merchandise. We have the dock over in uh, China that's just waiting to let go of spring merchandise. And we have factories filled with spring merchandise and we're heading into the fall season. So how that exactly looks for the fashion industry, we don't know how anyone is gonna deal with it. We know that a lot of wholesalers are gonna start closing. We know that the retailers, the small independent retailer, I've used the number of 30 to 40% will be closing and people said to me, you're, you're, you're low. Um, as stunning as that may sound. And the evolution of whatever retail was going to look like from six months ago to today has, has changed, right? So if a pair of high-end shoes is selling for $300, what do you think might happen as we get into the late summer, early fall? If it's a supply and demand issue, there might be a drop in prices because we know we have a lot of uh, supply and we don't know what the demand's gonna be. We don't know how pent up it is. We don't know what appetite consumers are gonna have. And at $300, we have you know, the likes of Neiman Marcus who are closing stores and we have Nordstrom closing stores. So there might be a glut of uh, merchandise out there. Might be consumer friendly. Do you think this is a permanent change in the supply chain or do you think that COVID-19 notwithstanding, things could revert to normal by the end of the calendar year. 
there's going to be a no looking back. Things have changed. There's going to be a big difference unless there's some event that we don't know about yet today that the manufacturers that I've spoken to in the factories over in Asia, um, I've asked them if they've wanted to look to start setting up shop here or if they're going to set up shop somewhere else. And the answer was we can't set up shop because everyone's ordering equipment. We don't know where it's going yet. So we know that the manufacturing base is going to slide out of China, out of Asia. We just don't know where, where it's going to land. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing to have the manufacturing base slide out of Asia? Uh, for geopolitical reasons, I, I, you know, I, I think the answer might be yes, right? So we, we have to we, we worry about human rights. We worry a, a lot. That's it's paramount. So uh, it's not a bad thing. We just have to make sure that it end, ends up in a place where we don't have to worry about that as much. What is the single biggest thing that keeps you up at night right now about your business? We don't know really what tomorrow is. We know it's going to be different. We know it's going to change. We just don't know what the change is going to be. We don't know who's going to be there. I know that one major uh, footwear retailer um, is going to lose 15 to 20% of their employees. They don't know what anything's going to look like. And they're just like fastening their seatbelt, trying to move forward responsibly without tripping on themselves. Larry, thank you very much. Thank you. Larry Rhinus, independent footwear consultant, talking about possible permanent changes in the supply chain. Support for the language of business is from Boston University Questrom School of Business. We're also available as a podcast on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for watching.